All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to read verses 6 through 13. Amen. Uh, Romans 12, verses 6 through 13. Having, uh, we'll read the passage and open uh, in a word of prayer. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity, to the necessity of saints, uh, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ and his precious blood. I thank you for the lings and their uh, willingness to hear your word preached. And I pray that they'd be helped by it this morning. I pray that they'd give your words entrance into them, Lord, that they would hear it, that they would abide it, that they would love it, that they would uh, have the courage and the strength to follow through and obey it and put these words into practice. And I pray that you do the same for Emory and I. Lord, be with us this morning. Uh, fill me with your spirit. Give me the words to say. Speak through me. I uh, pray for Brother Mooberry uh, and his family, that you'd give them strength and safety. Lord, and expedite uh, their way uh, to where you'd have them to be. Um, and I pray that my letter that I sent to them finds them safely, um, and that we'd have the opportunity to see them face to face for too long. Pray for Dale and Karen, the services that they're having in uh, in California this morning, and all the things that you know. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Uh, amen. All right. Now, just by way of review, we started in Romans chapter one talking about um, presenting your body as a living sacrifice, which is an elaboration on Romans chapter six, which talks about um, walking in the spirit and not in the flesh and yielding your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Uh, instead of member, members' instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And if you remember, the teaching of Romans chapter 6 is that you will pay in your body, for the, in your flesh, on this earth, for the sins committed in your body. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And so not to re-preach those entire three chapters, uh, which talk about that you don't have to walk after the flesh anymore. You don't owe your flesh anything, um, but you owe it to God to walk in the Spirit. And according to Romans chapter 8, you have the power and the ability to walk in the Spirit, because of the Holy Spirit that, that lives in you. It's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse I believe that's verse 2. Verse 2 or verse 3, somewhere right in there. And so unlike any other law, it's not just a bunch of commands that you're supposed to follow that you have no power to follow. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus gives you the Holy Spirit by which you have the power to serve God, to obey God, to follow through it, to put into practice the things that are instructed here uh, in, the, in the New Testament. 
And so in Romans chapter 12, he starts off by saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice, uh, which is your reasonable service. And the first thing he says is, be not conformed to this world. So you're not supposed to be like everybody else. You're not supposed to have the same thinking as the people in the world, which today is composed of um, transgender changing your gender, that uh, man and woman is a social construct, not uh, not uh, something that God instituted in the beginning. The Bible says, in the beginning, the Lord made them male and female, uh, not tree fairy in uh, you know, Hogwarts. It's male and female. And uh, even if you're so unfortunate as to be a eunuch or become a eunuch in life, uh, you're still a male or a female. Amen. It's one or the other. It's not both. And it's not something else. And with that comes roles that all men and women uh, are, are under that are commanded to follow, Christian or no. That's called the Adamic Covenant. Uh, the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve, which applies to all men. And that's why we have to work. He said, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread. He said to the woman, you uh, have pain in childbearing. Um, amen. And there's more to it than, than just what I listed there. But just by way of example, those are examples of, that's how the world thinks these days. As they put those things away, they put them behind them. And you can be whatever you want to be, um, even another gender. And that is filthy. It is a lie. It is uh, out directly from the pit of hell. And uh, But it's not your job to punish them. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Amen. But it is our job to not think like them. Be not conformed to this world. Don't go along with that. Um, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So first, you're not supposed to be like the world, like everybody else. You're supposed to think according to what this book says, not what you grew up believing. You're supposed to conform, transform your thinking according to what the Holy Spirit teaches in the words of the pages of the King James Bible, uh, not what your father told you if they disagree, not what your opinion is if they disagree. Not even what the preacher told you if it disagrees with what the pages of this book say. Uh, which is why I try not to say anything except just read the read it right off the page. Amen. So be not conformed to this world, number one. Number two, quit thinking so highly of yourself, verse three. Because we're all in the same body. We all don't have the same office. And what we do have are gifts from God. And the gifts that we have from God are each in a different measure. Uh, whether it be grace or whether it be faith uh, or whether it be office. All members have not the same office. He said in Corinthians, are all apostles? And the answer is no, all are not apostles. There were 12 of them, and actually there were more than 12. Um, but all are not apostles. There aren't any apostles since then. Amen. And I am certainly not an apostle. Um but because we have gifts, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, and remember, this is all predicated on present your body as a living sacrifice to God. Commit yourself to obeying God with your body, not your own desires, not what's easy, not what you feel like doing, right? Commit yourself to what you know God wants you to do with your body, with your hands, with your feet, with your eyes, with your ears, with your tongue, rather than just what uh, what's in your wicked, deceitful heart. Submit yourself to God. And that means, number one, not being like the world, being separate from the world uh, and the people in it. It means, number two, uh, quit thinking so highly of yourself. It means, number three, we all have different gifts. We're all in the same body together. And so there's an order to which we have to do things. Um, and we talked last week about ministering, exhorting, and teaching, and how all three of those things are things that you have to wait for. That the teaching in Bible college today is you just go make a ministry. Uh, you just go out and, you know, uh, go do it and ask permission later. Uh, you know, I'm called to preach, so I should just go start a bunch of churches. And make... No, that's not what you should do. 
you should pray about it and ask where God would have you to go, and then you should go and do that. And wait wait for an answer from the Lord as to where you should go and what you should do. Now, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So you should be doing that no matter where you are and what you're doing. That's that's what we call general orders. <laughs> it applies to everybody. Um, but these three things in verse uh, 7, ministry, teaching, and exhorting, they're all things that you have to wait for. That you have to wait for the opportunity. Um, and now if you... And so, and all the other things that are listed here throughout the rest of chapter 12, these are not things, well, I'm this way, you're that way. I'll do my thing, you do yours. This is my opinion, that's, and I just have my own opinion on the matter. I'll go to some church that agrees with my opinion, whether it be uh, 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 Church of Christ or Methodist or um, Presbyterian or Pentecost, what, just whatever it is, just go to the church of your choice, pick the church that matches whatever you happen to be predestined predisposed no that ain't the teaching of the bible in the bible there are specific instructions in english so that you can understand them plain in one place it says now the spirit speaketh expressly that means clearly plainly it's not playing a trick on you you don't have to go to another country to figure out what it said you don't have to go on a long journey to find it it is sitting in your lap and god speaks to you directly uh, when you read the words amen all right, so the, so these things in Romans chapter 12, there are specific instructions for how you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to think, which means that if you are full of pride and you think that you're better than other people, verse 3, cross-reference Philippians chapter 2, then you are not what you're supposed to be as a Christian. You're not uh, following the instructions of not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. See? Because the world says uh, you're special. The world says you can go anywhere you want and do anything you want. The world, and nothing against the Marines. I love the Marines. My dad was a Marine. I would have been a Marine if the Lord let me. Uh, but they're one of their big things, you know, the few, the proud, the Marines. And I one time was on a Marine base with my dad. And um, there's a aircraft hangar, and there's a big, gigantic, like 20-foot deep uh, banner over the top of the hangar that just said pride. See? And so in the world, you're supposed to have pride in yourself. You're supposed to have confidence and pride in your own ability. And you're supposed to fight, and, and you are supposed to fight as a Christian just for different things. But pride is not to be found in a Christian. Now, we all have it, we all struggle with it, and we all have to fight against it because we're, we're made of flesh and sinners like everybody else. But you're not supposed to give yourself over to that. You're, that's just it. You're supposed to fight against it. You're supposed to resist it. The Bible says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Amen. Now, so these things that are listed here, that's an, an example of, uh, uh, from verse 3, but the rest of these things that are listed here, they're not like somebody's opinion. These are the commandments of God as to how you're supposed to be. So when we get down in verse 8 and he says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. That has meaning that is not a matter of opinion. And it is, it is instruction that we're all supposed to follow. Um, and so th uh, there's a couple ways in which you can, when you give, give simply. Uh, the process of giving should be simple. It shouldn't be complicated. Uh, I'll give you an example. One time I was in, when I was in Pensacola, I was uh, in a church, good church, Bible-believing church. I preached the Word of God there. And, and um, on Wednesday night we used to have prayer meeting, and they said anybody, uh, and I was resisting uh asking for help. I needed help. I didn't have any money and the brakes had gone out in my car and I needed a way to get to work. And I was resisting asking for help because, well, let's just face it, I'm full of pride. And the Lord said, you better ask for help, boy. And I was like, well, no, I'll, I'll try to work it out. I'll find a way. I don't need help. I'll figure it out. I'll find a way. I'll do this. I'll do that. And the Lord said, I'm telling you to ask for help. So finally I said, okay. Raise my hand. 
my brakes are on my car, I need to get to work, I could use some help. And the pastor got up and said, well, amen, brother. I uh, appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Uh, we'll pay for uh, the brakes if one of the mechanics in the church, because people in the church were mechanics, if one of the mechanics in the church would be willing to uh, to install them. And that way it all be taken care of. I was like, amen, that's good. So that takes care of the whole thing, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. does not take care of the whole thing. So I go to uh, the pastor and I said, uh, hey, brother, I just want to know how this is going to work. You know, what do you want me to do? How do I make this happen? He says, oh, you got to talk to uh, brother so-and-so, the treasurer, and he'll give you the money. So I go talk to brother so-and-so, and he said, yeah, uh, he shouldn't have promised you that. We don't have the money to give to that this week. So I said, uh, okay. And, and then uh, meanwhile, this mechanic who had volunteered his time, he's like, well, I, you know, I don't know what to do. I can't install brakes that you don't have. And at the time, I was making like $150 a week or something, you know, $8 an hour digging ditches, uh, paying tuition, which was, which I put before all else. The, the instruction of the Word of God, beg, I, I, uh, I had somebody tell me when I was young, I should beg, borrow, and steal for every piece of the Word of God that I can grab while I can get it. And that's what I did. And so other things suffered because of that, but I don't regret it one bit because I got the Word of God. While you guys were, uh, you know, shoring up your retirement fund. Amen. And I don't, I'm not ashamed to say that the word of God is better than whatever it is I would have gotten if I didn't do that. Word of God is better. Amen. It's, it's more precious than gold and silver. It's more to be desired, uh, than silver, it says in the book of Proverbs. Amen. Now, what I'm talking to you about is giving simply. So the, about the brakes, yeah. So I still got no money, no brakes, and I got a guy ready to install them, and I don't even know what to buy because I'm not a mechanic. I don't know anything. So I had to wait a couple, another two weeks before I got paid. Then I took my paycheck, went down, bought the brakes, uh, went to the guy. or Actually, he had to come with me to tell me which ones to get. And then he installed them for me. Um, and that was a big complicated thing, which is not what I needed. And I really and truly believe that the Lord showed me that so that I could learn that when I give somebody something, to do it simply. Hey, look, I'm having a hard time. I need some money to put in my car. I don't need a, to be taught a lesson. I don't need instruction. I don't need a, a lecture. What I need is help. And sometimes... Uh, and when from the stand standpoint of the person who's giving, you should give simply so that it's not hard for them to get it. Don't just put it out of reach. You know, I'm, uh, I owe this loan shark to that. Uh, you shouldn't borrow money from a loan shark and shame on you if you did. And what's our man? So it actually also reap. I'm just, it's the only example I can think of where there's a severe consequence. So, you know, I'm in debt. I owe $2,000 to a loan shark. And it's going up to 3000 if I wait another week before I pay him, right? So how, can you help me out? Can you help me just get out of this situation that I'm in? Well, you shouldn't have gone. Yeah, I got that. I know. I shouldn't have. I made a mistake. I, I learned my lesson. Can, can you help me? I'll tell you what. I'll give you a half. You come up with the other half. Okay, that means i got to come up with $1,500. It might as well be a million. I'm making $150 a week. This is due on Friday. Well, if you wanted it bad enough, shut up. You don't know. You're the one who spent your whole youth uh, setting money and saving your money in your retirement fund instead of living week to week like me because I begged, borrowed, and stole. To, I spent my youth getting the Word of God, not glory. Getting the Word of God, not riches. Getting the Word of God, not uh, a big fancy ministry that I could be full of, proud of pride about and boast about. I got the word of God, and that means humility. And even where I'm not humble in my mind, which I need to be, God saw fit that he didn't give me occasion to be even more proud unnecessarily. Lord, how come I don't have a big church? <clears throat> because you're still too full of pride, number one. Number two, that ain't my plan to begin with. Number three, you need to start listening to me and not trying to make a name for yourself. And I'm preaching a little bit about myself. I'm defrauding myself so that you can get the message and hopefully apply it to how it applies to all of you. See? 
simply give. People need help. Uh, when the, when Paul, when the churches of Ikea in 2 Corinthians 8 ministered to the poor saints which were at Jerusalem, um, and they begged Paul in their affliction and deep poverty to take their money so that they could minister carnal things to the poor saints which were at Jerusalem because they owed him a debt because, uh, because, uh, salvation is of the Jews and unto them were committed the oracles of God. And we have the word of God and we know about Jesus Christ. Because of the Jews, so we owe them a debt, so we should pay that debt, right? But when they gave that money, there was no requirement attached to it. Here's money. What do you need? How can I help you? I need it right now. I need a shower. I need a bath. Can you help me with a bath? Right now, I need a place to stay. Right now, I need a meal. Right now, I need five bucks, and I don't need to explain to you what I'm going to spend it on. See, give simply, don't give and don't use giving as a means of control. Well, I gave that church 50 grand so they can towards their building fund. That ought to buy me a say in the decisions that they make. See, that's wicked and evil. So is 50 grand for a building fund, probably, but maybe not. I don't know. It would be for me because that's not what the Lord has led me. But my, my point is to give simply. Just give simply. Um, you see somebody needs something? Fill the need. Uh, we preached, or I preached not that long ago about tithing in the New Testament and how it doesn't exist. And it's wicked and evil to, to, to require that your members, which also is not a New Testament doctrine, uh, members of the body of Christ, no members of a local church. Um, but that there should be an equality, that when we need something, you should give, and when you need something, I should give. Um, not just between members of the same church, but between churches, like was the case with the poor saints at Jerusalem and these Gentile churches in Ikea and Philippi, um, which gave. Give simply, not giving as a means of control. Give simply, and also give cheerfully. Turn to 2 Corinthians 9. We're not going to get through everything I planned uh, this morning, I don't think. It's already looking that way. It's okay, though. 2 Corinthians 9, I'd rather be led by the Spirit than make my will happen in the message. Amen? 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, look down in verse 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. So give uh, simply, number one. Number two, according as you purpose in your heart, not the set amount that's required by the by the building fund or the pastor that's exhorting uh, extorting you out of your money. Purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity. So not this big complicated thing, but just cheerfully. For God loveth a cheerful giver. God wants you to just be happy to just let your money go. You shouldn't care about your money. It shouldn't be the thing that you trust in. You should trust in God. And um, I'm not real big on money and offerings and tithing and stuff, but I believe in giving when the Lord tells me to give or when I purpose in my heart to give. You know, like we just gave that money to that missionary and we'll do it again to him or to another missionary or to whoever the Lord leads us to give to. Amen. Um, but it's not a set amount. It's not a requirement. Um, and it's not like something that I had to do. It's something that I meant to do willingly and cheerfully and simply. And it's not to be used as a means of control or anything else. Uh, just give simply. Amen. All right. So that's the way you ought to be. That's the Bible instruction for, for how you ought to give. You ought to give cheerfully. You ought to give simply. You ought not to invent doctrines about it that don't exist to extort your people to make sure that you have a steady income of at least 10% of their income. 
which that is an Old Testament doctrine that the Jews were required to do, and they paid uh, for not doing it. But we're not under the law, but under grace. Amen. And there, the instruction in the New Testament is entirely different than that. So when you give, you should give simply. Just simply. Not You don't have to sign an affidavit. You don't have to, you know, well, let's, let's let me write it down so you can pay me back. You know, just give it. Right. Give it exactly right. Give it cheerfully. Give it simply. And let it be a gift of love from the heart. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And, well, we won't look up all these verses, but if you follow the example of how God gives, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life, is that simple? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is simple. He didn't make it hard for you to receive that gift. All you've got to do is believe. Amen. God giveth the increase in 1 Corinthians 3, 7. He gives us the victory in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He gives us life in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. He richly gives us all things to enjoy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. He gives us wisdom to all men liberally, liberally and upbraideth not in James chapter 1, verse 5. He gives more grace in James 4, 6 in 1 Peter 5, 5. And the Bible says, Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. God gives us these things freely, and he tells us how to get them. And it's not a trick, and it's not a trap, and it's not a means of control. It's a free gift. And I'll tell you what else. He does it cheerfully. <laughs> Amen. And it's perfect, right? It's what's exactly what's needed. Amen. All right, now uh, let's look at uh, the next thing. He, uh, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. Now, this is one of, mo one of the most misused, misapplied, lied about verses in the entire Bible. People take this verse and see, see there, there's people that are meant to rule. So I'm the pastor, so I'm in charge, so I have rule over you. And there are some pastors that will even go so far as to exploit that and say, um, see, now watch. I'm in charge of my people. Watch how they obey me. So uh, see that line there? Jump to the right of it. Jump to the left of it. Jump to, you know, as an illustration just to prove that he has his rule and that he lords it over them and requires them. And you have to get permission from the pastor uh, before you start. I'm not making it up. It's a, it's a problem. And there's instruction in the Bible about it, uh, which proves that it's a problem. <laughs> Amen. But that's not your job as a minister of the Word of God. As a pastor, your job is to feed the sheep. And your rule, as it so describes it here, is not the kind of rule that Gentiles have, where they lord it over people, where they lord over you with authority. Your rule is a spiritual rule. You're, you're meant to speak as, as it were the oracles of God. Your only authority is what the Bible says. So when I tell you something, when I tell you to do something, I'm not, uh, telling you what to do. I'm, I'm relating to you what the Bible tells you to do. You see the difference between those two things? Amen, amen. Alright, now. Turn to Hebrews thirteen seven. Hebrews thirteen seven. We'll look at a, a couple of verses that, that have to do with this. Now this is these this teaching is perverted in, in both directions. Preachers use it to overextend uh, and and heap to themselves authority that they do not have. And uh and the other side of it is uh, people tend to rebel against what the preacher said um, because they know that he doesn't have he, – his only authority is what is the Bible. And so they won't listen to anything that he says. See, it's two extremes. So Hebrews 13, and look down in verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Say, who's that? Who have spoken unto you the word of God. 
Now, what does it mean to remember them that have the rule over you? Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So your job is not to just snap to and do whatever I say as the preacher. What your job is to do is to look at my faith, my belief in the words of this book, my belief and my trust in Jesus Christ, and you're supposed to follow that. You're supposed to follow. See, you see the difference between that and this authority of do this, do that, do this, do that. Hey, I want you to do this. I just said, I'm the pastor. It's my job to command because I have the rule. That's not the kind of rule we're talking about here. This is a rule which is an example. And if anything, it's here, have this food. Feed the sheep. Amen. All right, turn to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. And look down in verse uh, 17. Now, we just remember, we read about uh, the, them that have the rule over you, especially unto them who have spoken unto you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. So, the rule is the speaking of the word of God, and you're supposed to follow their faith in it. And then in 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So to rule well is to labor in the word and in doctrine. So if I'm doing a good job as a preacher, then that means I'm laboring in the word and in doctrine. 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and a laborer is worthy of his hire. See? Because what, what people have done is they've, they've made, and just while we're in this passage, I have to mention it, they've made the office of pastor such a sacred thing that the pastor is untouchable. Unless he does something so severe, uh, like adultery or murder or drunkenness, then uh, you can uh, remove him or rebuke him. But anything less than that, rebuke not an elder, uh, but entreat him as a father, the Bible says in verse 1. Rebuke him not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. But I want you to keep reading. Look at verse 18, or verse 19, rather. Now, we're talking about elders that rule that labor in the word and doctrine. We're talking about the laborer, muzzle not the ox that treadeth out his corn. We're talking about the them that speak to you the word of God. We're talking about the preacher, the pastor. Look at verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So if you're going to accuse an elder, you don't go to him in private. You go to him in the presence of at least two or three people. So in that incident that we all know about, when I accused an elder, I did it in the presence of like 30 people. Amen? Which was obedience to this verse. And also the next verse. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. See, when a preacher messes up, it's a much bigger deal. And they need to be exposed and stopped. Otherwise, what you end up with is a bunch of sheep going after them, thinking that they're doing the right thing when they're not. I'm reading it to you off the page. Them that sin, who's them? Uh, the elder that you're only supposed to receive an accusation in front of at least two or three people. The elders that rule well, uh, verse 17. If they sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another doing nothing by partiality, which we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Partiality. See? Well, he's a man of God. No, he's not. If he's not preaching the Word of God, if he's lying about what it says, if he's using it at a, as a means of control and of gain, instead of just giving it to you freely, feeding you, as uh, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ said to Peter, Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Lovest thou me more than these? Feed my sheep. 
Rav said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then feed my sheep. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, there's a couple verses uh, that I need you to see. Uh, first of all, I'll turn to First Peter that define uh, what this ruling is. First Peter chapter 5. I'm sorry, you're in, you're back in First Timothy five. For the Scripture saith, right? Right. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. What the teaching of verse seventeen and eighteen is, you ought to reward that guy, count him with double honor, and you ought to take care of him and reward him um, for laboring in the word and in doctrine. But as opposed to that, if they don't labor in the word and the doctrine, and in doctrine, you're going to accuse them of having bad doctrine or some such thing. And you better make sure you got at least two or three witnesses so they can't lie about what you said later. And secondly, you better see that you do it because I'm charging you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21. And you better make sure you rebuke before all that others may fear. You better do it before the whole church. This is different than, well, go to him in private, which I did do. Then in the presence of it, which I also did. First Peter 5. First Peter 5. See, we wouldn't have this problem with denominations if people obeyed the scripture. We'd have uh, good churches and we'd have uh, people that were uh, kicked out of church for doing bad. We wouldn't have these fake churches that teach uh, bad doctrine. First Corinthians 5. I'm sorry, first, first, no, no, Peter, I'm sorry. First Peter 5, uh, starting in verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort. So that's me, I'm about to get exhorted. Who am also an elder, that's Paul, he's speaking, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he's seen the sufferings of Christ, uh, he wasn't there when Christ was crucified, but he was there when Stephen was crucified, when Stephen was martyred. Stephen wasn't crucified, but he was martyred. And Paul himself killed Christians. He said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, in Philippians 3. And he says, I'm a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, which means that he's also a partaker of the sufferings himself. Look at verse 2. So what's the instruction for pre for preachers? Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed them, taking the oversight thereof, you know, oversee them, not by constraint, but willingly. Now that there is me. I shouldn't do it because I have to of constraint, but I should do it willingly. Not for filthy lucre, not because I want money. See? That's filthy lucre. That's money. Now, I shouldn't be doing it for money, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being an example in samples to the flock. See? So it's, it's against the Bible for me to claim authority over you that is not given to me. My authority is to be an example of what this book says. And to say what this book says to you, and to feed you with it, and try to help you by help you to grow by it by teaching these words to you, and uh, as a ministry of the Holy Ghost. All right, verse four. And when the chief shepherd shall when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. If I do these things uh, faithfully the way I'm supposed to. One more. Turn to Matthew chapter twenty. Matthew chapter twenty. Uh, and we'll deal with uh, look at we'll look at what Jesus said about uh, ruling and how you're supposed to rule. Same thing in marriage. Same thing. Um, you know, it's not my job to go around lording it over Anne Marie every second of the day. That I'm in charge. She has to do everything I do, everything I say, every second of the day. But it is her job to submit to me in everything. See? See the balance there? 
All right, Matthew chapter 20, and look down in verse uh, um, uh, Matthew 20, uh, starting at verse 20. Then came to the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him. Uh, that's Peter, James, and John, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he s said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. So you understand what they're asking. Uh, in the millennial kingdom, want Peter on one side, John on the other. I believe it's Peter and uh, John. I could be wrong. The sons of Zebedee, the mother of Zebedee's children. Uh, but Jesus answered and said, You know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptist, baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, ye shall, After he just got through telling them, You don't have any idea what you're even asking. And then rhetorically says, Are ye able to do to, uh, to be to drink of this cup and be baptized with my baptism? And he said, We are able. Which, by the way, that ain't water baptism. That's a baptism of suffering, of dying on the cross. And he saith unto them, Ye shall, ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on, okay, James and John, my bad. Uh, to sit with, to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to him, to to him, to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. And Jesus called unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Which, that's how you know what the word minister means. It means servant. See how they're used interchangeably there in verse 26 and 27? Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And as he departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So it's my job to minister unto you. It's my job to be your servant. It's my job to help you. It's my job to feed you the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. Amen. It's not my job uh, to create some hierarchy that the Bible doesn't know anything, well, it knows about it, that the Bible doesn't intend for us to have. The Gentiles act that way. We're not supposed to be conformed to the world. Amen. Amen. All right, back in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Um, actually, let's uh, let's stop there, and we'll we'll continue um, after the, uh, the break. Uh, dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ and the precious blood that He shed. I thank you for these things that you've given us so that we don't have to wonder how we're supposed to be, what our personalities are supposed to be like. And, uh, Lord, I, we can all have different personalities, and we having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us and all those things, Lord. But, but this instruction that you've given us is the same for everybody, uh, to give simply um, and cheerfully, um, to rule with diligence. And not lord it over, but be an example to the flock. To feed the sheep. And all the other things that uh, we'll get to as we go. Uh, be with us this morning. Help Brother Frank uh, to stay awake. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.